and I am the project manager for the AATCLC. I'm also a visual artist. That is my true identity. <laughs> I, I'm a visual artist. I have been my whole life. And uh, I'm also an independent curator and I curated an exhibition called Same Game, Different Smokers. But today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the visual culture of uh, associated with the tobacco industry and um, the role that art plays in the tobacco industry. So um, I started with this first slide and I titled it Use is Directed, right? That's a term that is often um, utilized to as a cautionary term, you know, to help us know that we need to use a product only as we are told to use it. The interesting thing about tobacco is that when used as directed, it'll more than likely kill you. It's one of the few products out there that's essentially the, the makers know is going to kill their customers. Most nicotine products do not come with instructions. Most nicotine products used in uh, advertising and print and films have been key training tools for the tobacco industry, right? So historical evidence says that the tobacco industry files uh, discovered as a result of um, various lawsuits trace how the tobacco industry collaborated over time with the U.S. film industry and the print industry to push smoking and promote brands. So you don't see t most tobacco products. You don't see place cigarette in mouth, light end of cigarette. You know, they teach you how to smoke and how to use their products by um, promoting the ideas of not only how to utilize them, but how to relate to them. So imagery in the tobacco industry um, or pushed by the tobacco industry is latent with propaganda that sparks mental associations between tobacco products and health, glamour, prosperity, and just us living our best lives. But also, also very importantly with white supremacy, white benevolence, and revisionist history about the pleasantries of slavery, because those did not exist. <laughs> so all these things are counter to the stark data that is reported and uh, I'm sorry, stark data and, and tr actual reality. So it said the cigarettes are amongst the most marketed products in the history of marketing. And of course, we see these massive rates of death from this deadly product, this poisonous product that is marketed um, and may and makes uh, has been marketed for uh, more than a century to make people believe that they um, are not half as deadly as they truly are. Now, people have known for a long time that smoking is a health hazard and people have spoken out against it. Now, I have zero good things to say about King James of England. Let's just be very clear. But what he did do is he wrote um, a document called A Counterblast to Tobacco in 1640. And he called in it, he called tobacco a loathsome, uh, a custom or smoking, excuse me, a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose harmful to the brain and dangerous to the lungs. So these people knew that uh, smoking and tobacco was bad. Folks have been speaking out against it for a long, long time. Um, they are also created pr uh, products to help people stop smoking. This is an ad from the 1900s for no to no back <laughs> to uh, help people stop uh, utilizing tobacco products. Now, I wanna insert something very important here because when we talk about tobacco industry advertising, um, and targeting the black community. They did, it's more than just advertising. As Sterling pointed out, the tobacco industry is is um, inextricably linked for, to the chattel slavery industry. It was a huge industry in this country. And it is also connected to the history, the problematic history of the start of policing in this country. So um, these are some slave patrol regulations um, that existed for what people call the patty rollers or the the folks who chased down uh, enslaved humans uh, when they would either you know escape the plantations or the places where they were working um, but also people who were just they may have been enslaved and running errands uh, i want to bring your particular attention to two items one it says um that the patty roller shall have uh the power to inflict corporal punishment uh if two present uh, decide that they want that's that's that that's what they want to do if two be present agreeing there too so if they just two of them are there to decide they want to brutalize a, a black person 
they were well in their rights to do that. And also one patroller shall have power to seize any Negro slave who behaves insolently, who behaves insolently um, to a patroller or otherwise unlawfully or suspiciously and holds such slave in custody until he can bring together a requisite number of patrollers to act in the business. That's all barbecue Becky right there. The calling the police on black people for the, it's all connected to that same history of white, pol white people policing the black body and black people and modern policing, um, supporting that and i'm not talking about all white humans i'm talking about folks who have white supremacy so ingrained in their psyche that they can't function um and many of them are police officers um not all police officers but many of them are so we have to we can't pretend like those origins don't exist when in in the early ads, um, black people in early ads in general, but especially in tobacco ads, black people were portrayed as lazy and irresponsible, childish and ignorant. Um, Africans from the, from the continent were portrayed as savages, as well as uh, a threat. Um, they these ads mutilated our features and exaggerated our facial features and they also mocked our vernacular as you see here where this quote says my it sure am tasting we don't talk like that it was a you know this is a misrepresentation of black vernacular which is actually um something that people try to mimic all the time anytime somebody wants to sound cool they want they do whatever they can to mimic us so they did so to promote the dispossession of black people's recently hard won rights anytime we uh, gained rights around anything these ads were there to try to prove and the media was there to try to prove that we were savages and we didn't deserve um, those rights, whether it was ads, media, science, etc., and the tobacco industry participated in that. All of these things, these ideas, the happy slave, um, this, the threatening savage, all this is grounded in white supremacy. And these images were widely distributed by the tobacco industry for many, many years. And they helped people to justify atrocities perpetrated against black people, whether it was slavery or whether it was general daily terrorism, Jim Crow, social disenfranchisement, whatever it is. Um, you know, they, because we were promoted to be uh, savages, um, the it was easy to justify um, terrible behavior towards us. Now, um, there were a number of products that had terrible names like nigger hair. Um, this was a real product, nigger hair, tobacco, coonskin cigars. And also there was a whole series of collector cards that talked about the savage, savage chiefs and rulers. Um, and they listed all these different chiefs and all these different, um, community spiritual religious rulers from cultures all over the planet and portrayed um portrayed them as as savages and people read about them and it was an adventure for them right but when you think about um nigger hair tobacco and coonskin cigars this is sort of um talking about removal of pieces of the black body and consumption of those pieces by uh, by the populace. So, you know, also at the time, which was one of the things that was very popular was lynching black people. And what did they do after a lynching? They would cut off pieces of the burned, charred, mutilated body and keep them as souvenirs. We cannot pretend that these ads that are put out by the tobacco industry, that their role in, uh, in supporting chattel slavery to bring about the growth of their industry and that um, any of their words is divorced from the reality of what black people were facing now this is a image of a person who has been lynched at a social lynching they were social events and and this is a postcard that somebody purchased to send to another person to say hey look at what we did this is the type of brutality that the tobacco industry has contributed towards um happening towards black people um for for many years it's problematic it's real and it needs to be called out so people who say the tobacco industry has been targeting the black community for the past 50 years that's incorrect they have been targeting us for hundreds of years literally hundreds also this 
epic saga against the savages. There was this promotion of this idea of, you know, white supremacy and the dashing, daring, brave white person and the benevolent, uh, the benevolence, the invincibility of the white man against black savagery. You know, these images are promoted in these products and then widely distributed. You might have it either on the package or you have these, these uh, images that are sent to stores to promote the various products and tell people to and encourage people to buy them. And they also did things like devaluing our hairstyles and our adornment and ways of being. You might go to ancient um, classical areas or parts of ancient uh, African antiquity and you see people who adorn themselves with natural things with leaves and but there's nothing wrong with that it's beautiful it had meaning it's symbolism and it's richness but what happened here is because these images were promoted as savagery then all of a sudden white folks are looking at these and saying oh yeah look at the savages uh, this is true and it makes me feel better about myself but what happens black people also see these images and they're like I'm not a savage I'm not associated with Africa so these images also sold self-hatred it did not just advertise products it ab also advertised the hatred of oneself uh, and, and that makes it even easier also to uh, to uh, perpetrate atrocities and also um, you know promote self-destructive behavior so now let's move on to um, 1927 1929 we still have the sort of pervasive circulation of these images um, with, you know, the, the nigger hair tobacco. This is a calendar, right? That people would get as a promotional item. Also, um, the minstrelsy with uh, this person in blackface selling old gold cigarettes. Um, you also, at this around the same time, Lloyd Spud Webb um, discovers menthol cigarettes. He had some cigarettes. He left them in a can canister of menthol crystals. I guess he was doing some breathing treatments and um, took him out, smoked his cigarettes and found him to be minty fresh and, and the, you know, menthol cigarettes were born. So um, they're the first widely sold menthol cigarette in America and Brown and Williamson la launched Cool as a brand in 1932 because they were impressed by Lloyd's Buzz Webb's uh, success. So, uh, I'm, lo I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Lloyd Spud Hughes, Lloyd Spud Webb, Lloyd Spud Hughes' <laughs> success. Um, so Cool was up, was marketed to upscale customers they had a penguin who was supposed to essentially be in a tuxedo with a cigarette and and a top hat right uh, but it was for upscale upscale whites this is the origins of menthol not the black cigarette but in actuality a menthol cigarette that was marketed to upscale whites um, but menthol cigarettes really took off in 1956 when rj reynolds and yes i said rj reynolds the same ones that are uh causing mischief in uh, all over the country, all over the world, they cr introduced Salem cigarettes with uh, the first uh, filter-tipped menthol cigarettes. So thanks a lot, Spud. You caused us a lot of problems, right? Um, so these are what early menthol ads looked like. So now, let's talk a little bit about the origins of marketing to the black community. Over time, um, images shifted or, um, it was discovered that the black community is a market segment, right? So um, then folks were realizing, boy, black people have money. Let's take a look at uh, a video that was actually created by Johnson Publishing, and it's called The Secret to Selling the Negro, which is a very, we're not even gonna talk about the problematic layered, real, multi-layered reality of that name, but um, The Secret to Selling the Negro. Let's take a look. Actually, give me just a second. I want to share my sound. All right. Right, so that very dramatic <laughs> opening is where they get this this thing i guess is the world's first email can you imagine if every time you got an email it did that we'd all be nerve-wracked and 
<laughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, it said the average wage, Negro wage earner today gets four times more money than uh, than a few years ago, um, according to the Secretary of Commerce of the U.S. So the income, you know, the, the Negroes income increased more rapidly than the income of all other Americans. So all of a sudden the tobacco industry was like, wait a minute now. Um, these are people that we can sell a lot of things to. And so um, let's look a little bit at, sorry, let's look, take a look at um, another portion where it is described, the, uh, the black community is described as a market segment. Hello, I'm Bob Trout. I've got a story here that I think is big, really big, because it's bound to have a terrific impact on business. I'm talking about a new market, a big new market. Millions upon millions of new prospects with $15 billion to spend. That's right, I said $15 billion. That's a lot of money, isn't it? The surprising thing is that it's a fresh market, still full of opportunities. It grew up so fast, got so big in a hurry, that few of us realize its scope. Now these days, nobody's likely to pass up chances to sell. And yet right here in our own front yard, there's a neglected market. There's money waiting to be spent. To get the story of this market, to be able to tell you the secret of selling the Negro, we did a lot of digging. We talked to leading businessmen, to customers, and to salesmen. We went to Washington, D.C. We set up cameras and other key points around the nation. And out of this all, there emerged a story, the story of a new market. So the important thing to note is that folks were very well aware of how much money was available. Sorry, in the black community. Hello, I'm Bob Trump. Uh oh, uh, how much money was available in the black community? Um, so now you see a shift to very positive imagery. You see imagery that uses prominent figures, um, whether it they're famous people or someone who's a chief of police. You know, you might not know this guy, but you just see that he's a person of authority. And uh, instead of the coon type image, you see. Um, you see these advertisements that say things like the man who thinks for himself. So now you have the people who are starving for positive imagery of themselves, um, absolutely inhaling these images. They're beautiful images and they say positive things about black people. You just weren't seeing that. The challenge is that the uh, the images are wrapped in um, these these ter terrible products or these terrible products, these poisonous, deadly products are being wrapped in these images so that your mind associates um, one with the other. When we, uh, you know, we also saw the um, emergence of menthol marketing towards black people, right? So it rears its ugly head and, um, and many of our own publications are the ones that uh, were saturated with these images. So around this time as well is the birth of um, the Johnson Publishing Company. And they had um, publications like Jet and Ebony and Tan and Hue, all these color related images. But basically um, throughout the multiple decades, these publications were replete with images from the t from alcohol and tobacco namely the tobacco industry and the uh, johnson publishing company you know definitely welcomed those images which was problematic but um but yeah they they really the uh, tobacco industry dedicated a significant amount of its resources or sig significant amount of resources towards um advertising in these magazines and they did so because um, they wanted to utilize them in a very divisive manner. So you think about, we have to think about what Jet and Ebony, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, meant to the community. They were trusted sources of information. You showed very opulent styles of beauty queens, et cetera, et cetera. So we fantasized about living rooms that looks looks a lot like the one you see here. But in actuality, this is typically what, what the living rooms in my life looked like. Just add some, uh, some super thick plastic on the couch. Um, but one of the things that's important here is that you see this, ep this issue of Ebony Magazine on the table. Um, and that's the way that um, Ebony was. Ebony and Jet, they had pride of place in our homes. Um, they, we consumed the images and the products that they sold. And then also, um, you know, throughout the years, they changed to fit what our styles were and what our, um, and what was important to us, right? Um, 
they brought these tobacco industry brought vital dollars to communities that were um marginalized for centuries and we were so hungry that we took we you know many of our industries took that money but the tobacco industry knew what it was doing in terms of pushing its products because they knew um that our our entities were starved for support they also knew that that support brought silence so this quote is a very famous one um from the industry um, it says, you know, we don't smoke that SHIT. We just sell it. We reserve the right to smoke um, for the young, the poor, the black, and the stupid. So that um, allegedly is a quote from uh, R.J. Reynolds' tobacco company executives. And the, one of the greatest threats and challenges is that corporations are hell-bent on increasing their products, no matter what the human cost, even though they know how unhealthy these products are. And I know I'm, I'm out of time. Just give me like three more minutes, Akili. Is that okay? Just three more minutes. Okay. Thank you. So um, also, you know, there's this trend. They pretend to care while they kill us. Um, you know, the Philip Morris printed this this article talking about how dedicated they were to the black community. And they talked about rather than ignoring the, the black consumer in the 1940s, Philip Morris developed a strategy of marketing to all minorities by placing advertisements in black newspapers and magazines well before most other large corporations did. Now, what they did in this particular letter, if you read the entire document, is they outlined their strategy. You know, they're so stupid, they tell on themselves, so they outlined their entire strategy. And um, so we can see exactly how they went about targeting our our community and, and our entity. And again, the support bought silence, it bought access, it also bought validity, and it bought trust. Um, and they used our own institutions and often our own community leaders to do it. Also, um, support for the fine arts, right? Um, the cool jazz festival, something that's very popular. You know, we once again we pretend to care, but we while we kill you, but they wrapped it in art. Um, Brown and Williamson pointed out in one of their documents, um, the, clearly the sole reason for their interest in black and, and in investing in black and Hispanic communities was the actual potential sale of their products. So they wanted to keep themselves, their names in our spaces and pretend like they really cared about us so that we would trust them. And this is an excerpt from Smoking with the Enemy by our um, our very own Dr. Valerie Yerger. Um, so essentially the conclusion you know we can conclude that um the point of their participation is to say so that they can pretend to have a good record of contributing to and supporting the black community we see that over time the coon image endures and this is 1970 the man's wearing a daishiki but he's doing the popeyes and the in the you know uh pushed out mouth um saying it gives me a tingle in a very um in a very caricaturized way um we also see this image of jump jim crow that we talked about earlier the the minstrel character that the system of segregation is named after uh repeated in a two in a 2007 ad for newports um so they're not slick and none of these things ends up in an advertisement, um, you know, uh, by accident. Also, this myth of the black male hypersexuality and sexual prowess, as well as black promiscuity. This woman is not looking at his hands on that piano or um, looking at his cigarette, right? Um, it implies it also that um, the viewer, when looking at this image, is a part of this sort of hypersexualized space because the cigarettes that they're smoking, the two are missing from this space of the cigarette. So this is how they trick your mind to um, to to pull you into these advertisements. Um, also, they use respective figures like Jackie Robinson, who, by the way, didn't even smoke. You never see a cigarette in his mouth in any of these ads. He's always just holding them or they're next to him because he didn't smoke. And um, the, the story goes that his manager actually um, made the deal for him to serve as a spokesperson um, and didn't give him any money. So this sounds like something right out of the book, $40 Million Slaves. Um, now, this also this appropriation of cool is something that they used to do and it's something that they still do. This is a camel cigarette and this is a uh, electronic cigarette. Um, it's the same tactic. Also, when you think about mental health, sorry, um, about 7 million people are suffering with mental health in the black community. This is an estimated number. And um, 
there's a significant comorbidity between tobacco use and behavioral health health disorders because a lot of people use um, tobacco as a stress reducer. We know that the mental health industry is failing everybody, including and especially the black community here. Um, but the, which makes these types of ads where supposedly this black man is resting and relaxing on this park bench smoking a cigarette all the more insidious because the tobacco industry knows these statistics just like we do. They also co-opted uh, the black power movement and created imagery that, you know, co-opted our style, um, our style of dress. You got black folks standing on a rug outside, smoking outside the African boutique, smoking cigarettes, etc. Sorry. Um, but realistically, you know, Newport was one of the most famous brands in no small part to their Alive with Pleasure campaign, which showed us doing everything and just having a good time, playing base basketball in our church shoes and you know, putting black women on a diet, you know, you're showing them Newport Slims and implying that women are slim, etc. You know, um, advertising density so that these advertisements were constantly in our faces um, and so that we can never get away from them. And there's always a suggestion of utilizing and accessing these items. And we did not take this sitting down. So, um there were artists, uh, artivists like Henry Mandrake Brown who painted over these advertisements because he's he recognized that alcohol and tobacco advertisements were um, part of the problem, a major part of the problem. And he also came up dead, you know? So this is real, um, This is these are real issues and this is a real powerful uh, industry that we're dealing with. But he painted over these, um, over these advertisements and got rid of more than 700 billboards in the hood in Chicago, as well as uh, uh, Reverend Calvin Butts. So um, it was tobacco control activists who brought down Uptown cigarettes, which were created specifically to be marketed to black people. And um, and those were gotten rid of very quickly and kicked off the market, but because people were not having it. Also, um, artist Hank Willis Thomas created the uh, Fair Warning series, where he removed uh, the images from tobacco as the backgrounds, as well as the cigarettes, and um, to explore what were actually being sold and told. So you have all these beautiful women in their, you know, two fingers placed in the air in a gesture that almost becomes this hand sim signal um, based on our subconscious reckoning or reasoning, hand symbol for black women's liberation. Um, he also recontextualized tobacco by um, using it in other artistic installations. So now we have tobacco industry's grandchildren rearing their ugly heads with using the same tactics. Um, this is young thug, rich homie Quan and Birdman. And don't be proud of me for knowing those people. I had to text my godchildren to ask <laughs> who these crazy, <laughs> these funny looking people were. But, um, you know, they're using the same tactics to um, these flavors, the bright colors, the promotions by people that folks trust, particularly young people, even like up, uh, promoting things like snus um, in our communities and you and utilizing these ideas that just like in the tobacco ads in the cigarette ads in the cigarillo ads, you're having a great time with your friends and smoking. Um, so I'll close by saying um, the other thing that we're seeing being repeated is the promotion of the idea that uh, people have a right to smoke and a right to vape, to vape, et cetera, et cetera. And that taking away that right or enacting very important public health legislation is akin to um, government control. So um, these are all ideas that are being marketed through um through our press and through our um, various media outlets. So with that, I will thank you so much for your time. I'm so sorry I went over and I'm gonna turn it over to Baba Akili. I appreciate that. Listen, the time that 